Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the Well Oasis International Empowerment Service. I hope you had a fantastic week. In fact, I'm definitely sure you had a splendid week, a spirit-filled, God-blessed week. Hallelujah, somebody. Father, we give you the praise in the name of Jesus. Welcome to the Well Oasis International Empowerment Service, where we'll be looking at Law 9 of John C. Maxwell's book, 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth. My prophesy unto you in the name of Jesus, you will grow on every side for good in the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody say hallelujah where they are. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Can we just say a moment of prayer, say a word of prayer before we, you know, kick on with the topic this afternoon. Uh, Father in heaven, we just want to say thank you. Almighty God, we want to say thank you. Olisa, we, say, we want to say thank you. The one the Yorubas called Atofarati, be okay. We want to say thank you. The God who is our deliverer, our stay, our buckler, our shield, the architect of our salvation. Oh, Father, we just want to say thank you. You are not only the architect of our salvation, you sent your son to pay the price so that that salvation would be available to us all. Baba, we want to say thank you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for enforcing the salvation that Christ paid for through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and through the ministry of angels that you have given unto us. Daddy, we want to say thank you in the name of Jesus. We bless you, sir. The angels look on from heaven and can see all your wonderful, generous, benevolent works to us, the sons of men. And they cannot help but cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. We join them to say, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Oh, all creation will bow and call you God. All creation will say, Jesus is Lord. Father, we just want to say thank you. We bless your holy name. We exalt you, Father. We give you glory, honor, and adoration in the name of Jesus. Father, your boy has, is presenting himself before you, sir. Please, sir, use me as a conduit. Use me as a pipeline so that your grace, your power, your generosity, your insights, your secrets will be delivered unto your people that they may receive emancipation, that they may receive growth, that they may receive expansion, that they will become poster boys and girls of the kingdom of heaven on this fallen earth in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, King of glory, uh, I'm the donkey and you are riding into Jerusalem. Ride on me all the way and get all the glory in the name of Jesus. Use these lips of clay for your glory. Amen. Let no power by whatever name, kind or description interfere with the revelation you intend to disperse to your people this afternoon in the name of Jesus. Amen. Any power that says he wants to, Father, strike them down in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Angels, move into the atmosphere and begin to enforce this word upon the heirs of salvation that are listening, wherever they may be listening, in the name of Jesus. And that at the end of it all, there shall be testimonies. There shall be testimonies, testimonies of expansion, testimonies of increase, testimonies of growth, spiritual, material, and on every side in the name of Jesus. Thank you, everlasting Father. In Jesus' most exalted name we have prayed. Holy Ghost, please come take control. Amen. So, uh, Law 9 is of John C. Maxwell's uh, book, 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth, is the law of the ladder. And the way he, he, he captures it in the book, he captures it in this way, you know, in, in like a subtitle, in, in, you know, on the first page of, of the chapter. He says, character growth determines the height of your personal growth. Character growth determines the height of your personal growth. I mean, for my own personal uh, ease of, of, of presentation, I've, you know, rephrased it for my own benefit, uh, you know. And, and I say this, I say character, personal growth is limited in the absence of godly character. Personal growth 
is limited in the absence of godly character. Remember, what we're looking at uh, uh, the 15 laws of growth. We're looking to grow here. And I'm saying to you, this is my take on it. This is my understanding. The scriptural perspective that I bring to, bear, bring to you today is that personal growth is limited in the absence of godly uh, character. The anchor verse for, my, for, for our discourse this afternoon is going to be Psalm 112, 1 to 3, as well as John 17, 20 through to 21. Psalm 112, verses 1 to 3, and then John chapter 17, uh, 20 to 21. Psalm 112, 1 to 3 reads as follows. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord that delighteth greatly in his commandments. Ah, his seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. I can hear somebody saying where he's sitting. Amen, that's mine. Amen, Amen that's mine. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. In other words, he has legacy. Hallelujah. And uh, for those who are on the air yesterday, you see what I'm saying. And he has legacy. His legacy endureth forever, both temporal and permanently. Praise Jesus. So, 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 based on this verse of scripture we just had a look at, it, it is clear that godly character is the foundation for success. Godly character. No, I'm not using character in a neutral sense. I'm saying godly character is the foundation for success. See what the psalmist said again. He said, Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth, and the generation of the upright shall be blessed. So, so, so that it is clear. Okay, if those two weren't enough, verse 3 kills it for me, or, you know, nails the point home. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. That is my portion in the name of Jesus. I will continue to be among them that fear the Lord and that delighteth greatly in his commandments. So shall it be for everyone else who is listening in the name of Jesus. John 17, verse 20, uh, verses 20 through to 21. Neither pray I for those alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Jesus was praying for his disciples. And then he goes further and says that they, may, they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Praise Jesus. So, so God's ultimate purpose is to transfer his character to us so that we would resemble Jesus and resemble him so that we are fit for purpose such that when we transition to our eternal home, we, I'm sorry, so that when we transition to our eternal home, we will be fit for purpose. Praise Jesus. Another point that I want to just quickly make is this. Let no one make any mistake about this. The character that God intends to transfer to us is his character paid for by Jesus Christ. Jesus is at the center of everything. He's the one, once we believe in him, we connect to the Father. He is the door. So, so the truth of the matter is that the character of God has been made available to us through the sacrifice of Jesus at Calvary. Please don't forget that. File it to one, put it to one side for now. The process of the transfers of his character, I'll repeat that. The process of the transfer of God's character, the process of our taking on board God's character, which causes us to change, is the process known as growth. The process of taking on board God's character that Christ paid for, which ultimately makes us change, is what is now called growth. Praise the Lord. So let me just try and do a few definitions so I don't want to, I, uh, so that I'm not rushing at the end as I tend to. Now, definition of integrity and character. Now, I'm looking at, I'm going to look at some secular interpretations of what these two words mean as well as ultimately scriptural perspectives on, on, on these words. But it is critical that, uh, I, I mean, just for clarity, I should say that integrity, uh, I'm using uh, uh, integrity 
uh, what's the word, uh, coterminously, that is in, you know, I'm exchanging one or the other. Either I'm going to say integrity or I'm going to say character. But to me, they are actually much the same. But I prefer integrity, actually, because it's much more clearer. Char character, you know, has neutral, has ne certain neutral, uh, 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 you know, constituents, which makes me prefer integrity. So there's no doubt about what we're talking about. Now, the quality, integrity is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. It is the quality, integrity is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. Ultimately, this was what I think the author, John C. Maxwell, was alluding to this particular interpretation, the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. Praise Jesus. Another meaning of the word integrity is this, it is the state. Integrity is the state of being whole and undivided. It is the state of being whole and undivided. It is the state of being whole and undivided. Now, 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 why is this definition, you know, of any relevance? You see, what happens uh, is that our, our words don't always measure up with our actions, meaning that there is a division, meaning there is a divide, meaning that the, 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 the totality of that man who is saying what is inconsistent, who is acting inconsistent with what he says, that, 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 that indicates that he is not whole. It indicates that he's in a state of, 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 of division. So this is because the outside align, aligns with what is on the inside. So integrity is, is what it is. That is. It is a state of wholeness or being undivided because the outside is meant to align with what is on the inside. Or put differently, it is what is on the inside of us that propels us to do what we do on the outside. So when the outside lines up with the inside, then what you find is that, that there is a state of integrity. So a man of God, by the grace of God, or a believer, let's not set the bar so high, a, a believer is meant to be consistent. What he's, what he's thinking on the inside and what he's planning on the inside is consistent with the word of God that he has received, A. B, it propels him to act in a particular way on the outside, praise Jesus. You do have situations where a believer is inconsistent. That is to say, he actually believes what God has said, but he actually doesn't manifest it in real life because he's probably, because of his state of growth, his state of development. What we are all aspiring for is to have the inside aligned with what is on the outside. Side. Praise Jesus. Now, character. Character is, the, men, is men, the mental and moral qualities distinctive to an individual. The mental and moral qualities distinctive to an individual. I'd like to define character this way. It is consistently doing the right thing based on my inner convictions and relationship with Christ. Character in my book is consistently doing the right thing based on my inner convictions and relationship with Jesus Christ. Consistently doing the right thing based on my inner convictions and relationship with Christ. Another definition that I, and this one I, I kind of, you know, fused it together from John C. Maxwell's comments in the book, is doing the right thing, whether it's convenient or not, or whether anyone can see me or not. It is doing the right thing whether it is convenient or not, whether anyone can see me or not. So true Christian character, in summary, is about absorbing, like osmosis, the character and nature of God. It is about being conformed to the image of Christ. I pray for yourself, I pray for myself, that in every way, manner, shape or form, we will be conformed to the image of Christ in the name of Jesus. So true Christian character is about absorbing like osmosis, the character and nature of God. It is about being conformed to the image of Christ. The scripture in support of this proposition that I, pro I commend for your attention is 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, 
even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So when there is a certain exposure to the Word of God, when there's a certain exposure and a consistent exposure to the Word of God, when there's a consistent exposure to, you know, the things of God, what you find is that the Spirit of God effectively, if you like, jumps from what you are hearing, jumps from the word you read, jumps from what you are hearing, jumps through your ears into your, into your spirit and into your heart. So it then begins to impact on how you carry on. And then before, I mean, before you can count one, two, three, what you find is that you begin to behave like, you begin to sound like, you begin to look like God because you are imbibing what he is saying by being in close interaction with him. Praise Jesus. Another verse of scripture that I want to commend for your attention is Romans 8, 29. For whom he did for know, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So, so this is another verse of scripture that's supposed to point that when we get up close to God, what he does is that he transfers his character, he transfers his abilities, he transfers what he is through his word to us. Praise Jesus. And then we begin to change how we are. We begin to change the way we behave. Praise Jesus. And you know something? You do it unconsciously. Before you know it, you, you don't even know it. Before you know it, you realize that this wasn't the way you used to react over issues before. Before, I, I love to say this, you know, I've said this many a time. Before, when I was a Catholic, nobody should mention tight near me. If you mention it, I won't answer you. I say, see Reverend Father is driving big car. See him living in big house. Me, where am I staying? Excuse me. He ain't getting one cover from me. But... <laughs> when I became a Pentecostal, my attitude changed. In fact, I no one preached it to me. I saw it in the scripture. I, I had the conviction. I just started doing it. Praise Jesus. So in the introduction, in the kingdom of God and in life, success without character or integrity is unsustainable. In the kingdom of God in, and in life as well, success without character or integrity is unsustainable. Character on the girds, or is the foundation of, or is the support structure for success. Character on the girls, or is the foundation of, or is the support structure for success. I had one Bible college, my Bible college teacher back in the day used to say, uh, charisma without character will lead to catastrophe. Charisma. Charisma refers to the gifts. It's a Greek word referring to the gifts and talents referred to in 1 Corinthians 12. Charisma, gifts and talents without character, integrity will lead to catastrophe. So character or the absence of it caps success. The same way, let me give you this example. Say for example, you, you are very thirsty and you want to drink water. But all oh, the only cup you have is an espresso cup. You know, anybody who knows uh, any coffee drinker will know that espresso cups are very small. Okay. For the people from Delta State, you know, you know that small cup that they used to disburse Ogogoro? <laughs> that small cup. So it, it's, that's, that's, this kind of, that's kind of like the size of a, what you call it, of, a, of, a, of an espresso cup. So even though you are thirsty, you can only pour the amount that will fit into the espresso cup. Only that amount. In the same way... Your potential is like what is in the jerry can. Your success is like what is in the jerry can. But the only amount you can pour out at any one time is the amount in the cup. So in other words, the bigger your character, I mean the bigger your cup, the more potential that can be filled into it. Praise the Lord. So um, I want to just cite a few examples of Bible characters, you know, uh, who, whose success was built on character or integrity. So for example, you have Joseph. You know, Joseph and Potiphar's wife. That's a classic example of integrity. Now, God ultimately honored his integrity. God ultimately honored his integrity in Genesis chapter 41 when Pharaoh was looking for the answer to a dream. And in fact, needed, he needed more than an answer to the dream. He actually needed a solution. And Joseph, by the Spirit of God, through the gift of the word of wisdom, was able to supply it. Another example of, of, of a Bible character who's whose uh, life, whose success was built on character or integrity is Daniel. You, you see it, I mean, the entire book of Daniel, but you can see a testimony to who he was in Daniel chapter 6, uh, no, Daniel chapter 5, when, uh, when the king's wife was, uh, you know, recommending him to interpret 
the handwriting on the wall. So those, the, the, I'd like to cite those two examples of Bible characters whose success was built on character or integrity. I want to also cite examples, a couple of examples of Bible characters who transitioned from weak integrity to solid integrity. So I want to cite people, an example, an example of someone that transitioned. And I, and I like these transitional characters because, you know, the first set of characters look like they dropped from the sky with it or appeared, you know, from their mommy's womb with it. But these guys, you can actually see their journey. So someone like Isaac. Isaac in Genesis chapter 26 didn't see his breakthrough eh? when he planted, before he planted. He didn't begin to get his breakthrough until he had confessed that, in fact, Rebecca was his wife. Until he first stopped that he had messed up, the breakthrough didn't come through. Praise Jesus. Another example of, uh, of a character that, um, and sorry, the moment he, he confessed, uh, the, the work of his hands were prospered. And the Bible records that he became great and waxed great and went forward. And then the Philistines envied him because he was the richest man in town. Praise Jesus. You too, you too, me and you too, will be the envy of them that look at us in the name of Jesus. Another example of a character that transitioned from weak integrity to full integrity is Jacob. Jacob is another example. You notice that Jacob, was, Jacob had supplanted and schemed past his brother twice. So Laban did the same to him <laughs> before God helped him to out-scheme Laban. Eh? But, but beyond that, the critical point is that it was when he wrestled with the angel from Peniel, it was from that point that Jacob's life transitioned into a place of peace and stability. No more schemes, no more devices, no more I'm being overly clever. So Jacob is another example of someone who transitioned from you know, weak, uh, from weak integrity to, to full integrity. Another person <clears throat> that transitioned from the place of weak character, weak integrity, to the place of, of a solid character and integrity is Peter. Peter, uh, um, Peter was uh, the man who said to Jesus, uh, and, you can, and this is a good example of how you can see the, income, the, the misalignment when the person is... is, is is still in the place of growth. So Peter says to Jesus on the night that Jesus is going to be betrayed, says, Jesus, I'll never leave you. No way. No, it's not happening, man. I'm going to be with you right up until the end. Anywhere you go, I'll go with you. Ask girl spoke to him. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Um, how do I put it? Domestic assistance. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Domestic assistant said, Ah, are you not what your accent is Galilean? Were you not walking around with Jesus? Oh, no, God forbid, bad thing. I swear on my father's name, I was not amongst them. Meanwhile, he was. So, 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 maybe I should say this point as a point of encouragement. Um, you know, there is an Israel lying dormant in you. Notice that Israel's transition, Jacob's transition, only began at the point of his renaming. So I'm saying to you, I'm saying to somebody, the person that can receive it, there is an Israel lying dormant in you, and that Israel will manifest even so shortly in the name of Jesus. Even, even so in the name of Jesus. Peter had character issues, but transitioned after God, Jesus restored him in John chapter 21, 15 through to 19. Another example I just want to give, I think he's in the extreme, just like, you know, this, uh, uh, Joseph and... Uh, and Daniel were in one extreme. This is the other extreme. The other extreme is Saul. Saul's greatest undoing as king of Israel was his failure to recognize his lack of character and integrity. That was his greatest failing. Even when he had offered the sacrifice and refused to wait for Samuel, and Samuel said, you know what? This kingdom is going to be taken away from you. Rather than him say, my father, please beg God on my behalf. His sole concern was, uh, please go out with me with the people as always, so that the people can see you are still with me. He was more concerned with the appearances and what men would say. And he wasn't interested in his relationship with God. So, you know, God can't help somebody that doesn't want to be helped. Anyway, let's, let's leave that. Let's go on. Uh, what I want to do now is I want to talk about John C. Maxwell's wrongs on the character ladder. He, he set up like five different wrongs. Wrongs are like those steps that are on a ladder. So he cites five of them. And the very first one is wrong. Wrong number one is
focus on being better on the inside than on the outside. Character matters. Focus on being focus on being better on the inside than on the outside. Character matters. Please bear with me. I'd like to phrase it, reframe it the way you know it makes sense to me. So so you could just put this in brackets or in parentheses besides you know the title I just read out. Focus on being conformed to the image of Christ. Focus on being conformed to the image of Christ. Focus on being conformed to the image of Christ. Acquiring godly character. Focus on being conformed to the image of Christ. The reason why I say what I'm saying is that because of um, what's this word that they are using now? Uh, there's this word they're using now. Um, is it the re relativity? This expression, is it the relativity of, of truth? In other words, everybody says, or what you find, the modern day newfangled thinking is, oh, that there is no absolute truth. Well, I have news for you news flash, CNN, or is this a M MNN? I have news for you. There are absolutes, and there are absolutes, there are absolute truths, and those absolute truths can only be found in the Word of God. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, truth is absolute, but for me, my version of truth that is absolute is the Word of God. Get it? So, so in determining what character really is, or what good character is, it is godly character that is the barometer, it is the plumb line, that's the measuring rod. So, I want to cite um, a couple of scriptures that I think, you know, um, illustrate the point. So, I, I like Exodus, uh, Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27, because it shows that the ability to conform to godly character is not something that is innate in us. It is something that, by the grace of God, we acquire. It's not, it's not you don't just fall from the sky and have it. God is the one who actually enables you to get it. Ezekiel 36, 26 through to 27. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and watch this, so, and cause you to walk in my statutes. Notice he didn't say, and you will walk. He says, and will cause you. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. So godly character is not only transferred through the ministry of the Holy Spirit as we saw in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It's continuous, it's continuous operation, it's sustainability, is a, also a spiritual process. All of this is also known as sanctification, but no time for that. Let's just move on. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. So John C. Maxwell breaks from one into three, three, you know, three sub headings. One is the inside, inf the inside influences the outside. B, the inside, inside victories precede outside ones. And then C, our inside development is entirely within our control. So I'll take each one real quick. So the first one is that, um, how does it go again? <laughs> yes, the inside influences the outside. So, I'll give you a couple of propositions. The first proposition is that the spiritual controls the physical. The spiritual, that is the unseen part of you, is what actually controls the physical. Somebody is cooking, somebody is frying fish in the kitchen, and you just love fish, like me, and you sniff it. That message, your five senses receive it, transfer it to your mind or your soul, and then your soul makes a determination. I will eat fish. So, when the soul makes that determination, the body is then constrained to get up to move to the kitchen, to go and get hold of that fish. Praise Jesus. That's how the thing works. So, the spiritual, the unseen part of you controls the physical. And just to commend you, now, that's uh, like, a, if you like, uh, a, a, a more carnal description of how the thing works. But this is how it actually works in the spirit. Hebrews 11, 1, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, which is unseen, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. 
so so when god wants you to receive something what he does is that he causes you to see his word his word that has made a promise and when that you know uh, that 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 word transitions into desire in your heart what you find is that you begin to take steps to bring about the manifestation of that thing that you saw as you go along god will give you grace god will give you favor god will lead you to people that will help you and whatever have you concerning the matter but it is god himself that is triggering that process and by the words of your confession that which you've asked god for will manifest Amen. so will it be for somebody who is listening today in the name of jesus Amen. because the inside influences the outside you have verses of scripture like proverbs 23 7 that says as he thinketh in his heart so is he as he thinketh in his heart so is he as he thinketh in his heart so is he and then there's this powerful verse of, uh, a powerful quote that I got from Samadhi Ami that I want to share with you that I think also captures the fact that it's what's inside that controls the outside. Whatever thought dominates in your heart will attract their material equivalent. Whatever thought dominates in your heart will attract their material equivalent. Whatever thought dominates in your heart will attract their material equivalent. If what you are carrying in your heart is a good thing, that's why the Bible tells us, I think it's in Philippians 4, that whatever things are good, whatever, so, whatever things have virtue, think on those things. So it's what you are thinking about, whatever is percolating in your heart, that's the thing that will manifest. If it's fear, then it will be something will make you, that will make you afraid, will manifest. If it's whatever it is that you are thinking about, if it's good stuff, then it's that good stuff that will eventually materialize because that's how God made us. He made us in his image. He thinks good things and when he thinks good things, he causes them, he makes a declaration from his mouth and those things come into being. Praise Jesus. That's why the, the Bible says in, in, in Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. B, inside victories precede outside ones. Inside victories precede outside ones. Our behavior is a product of our internal convictions. Our behavior is a product of our internal convictions. In Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, Daniel said this, But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Did you see, did you see that thing? He says, but Daniel purposed in his heart. It was something inside. He had made a determination on the inside. There's something, uh, we, we, I think we le I learned this from Pam Ross, and my wife has repeated it many times. You don't, you don't come to a conclusion. You, you, no. You decide before you have to decide. So before the temptation comes, you have already made up your mind what it is you will do. So when the temptation finally shows, finally shows up in front of you, you say, excuse me, I've seen you before, I know you, I've prepared for you. Guess what? Today is not your day. Tomorrow isn't looking good either, and even next year. And you tell it to be gone, and it will go. So will it be for somebody in the name of Jesus? Daniel's subsequent success all stemmed from his internal, personal resolution. I will not offend God by engaging in Babylonian dietary practices. Me and you all have to take that personal stand with the Lord. And say to the Lord, Lord, it is your word that I will comply with. All of us have to take a personal stand. That's what, the, that's what Daniel was doing when he said he proposed in his heart. We all have to take that stand. Praise Jesus. Our inside, is, uh, <clears throat> our inside development is entirely within our control. Our, our, pers our inside development, the development of godly character within us, is, is driven by our personal hunger. It is driven by our personal hunger. Listen to Psalm 25 verse 14. It is driven our growth... Our personal character development on the inside is driven by our personal hunger. Listen to Psalm 24, verse 14. It says, show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. The psalmist was hungry. There's no other way to say it. Uh, how about this one? Psalm 119, verses 10 to 12. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from, from thy commandments. What's that psalm? It says, as the deer panted for the, the, the water, so my soul longeth after thee. 
Psalm 119 verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart. So he not only read it, he memorized it, he, he read it, he memorized it, he recited it, he meditated upon it, so that he might not sin against thee. Praise Jesus. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. And then this one is a kicker from uh, Paul in Philippians 3, 7 and 8. He says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. That is, I'm ready to jettison anything that impedes me receiving you. Verse 8, yea, doubtlessly, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Huh, this guy was completely sold out, man. May, may we be as sold out as Paul was in the name of Jesus. Amen. Wrong number two. I will follow the golden rule. People matter. And the verses of scripture I want to commend for your attention and support this is Matthew 5, 44 through the 45 and verse 48. Matthew 5, 45, 44 through the 45 and then verse 48. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. The character we seek to imbibe is the character of God. And an aspect of the character of God is a ministry of love to mankind. An aspect of God's character to mankind is his love toward mankind. Because we carry his character in our soul and our spirit, our ministry here on earth is both to God and to man. Because we carry his nature, our ministry, to, our ministry here on the earth, the service we render is both to God and to man. Sometimes we render it to man because God is not available. We render it to man so that God will get the glory. We render it to man because we are filled with compassion. You see, this is, this is partly why the symbolism is, you see what I'm driving at in the symbolism of the cross. The cross is both horizontal and vertical. Upward toward God and across toward uh, mankind. Another verse of scripture that captures this point, Acts 13, 36, one of my favorite verses, it says, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, Acts 13, 36, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God. So David was there to serve his generation, but empowered by God so that God would get the glory. Praise Jesus. So, uh, so God gets glory when we, minister in love, when we minister love to other men. God gets glory. Jesus is advertised to the world and the world becomes a little bit better when we love our, our, our neighbor. And like I said, it's embedded in the character of God. You can't, you can't say you, are, you love Christ and then you are me. You really can't be. Okay, wrong number three. I will teach what I believe. Passion matters. I will teach what I believe. Passion matters. To make it simple for me, I don't know about you, I put in parenthesis beside this, uh, this wrong. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. Second Corinthians 4.13, may I recommend for your attention, says, reads as follows, We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, therefore we speak. We also believe, and therefore speak. My brothers and my sisters, when you are convicted in your soul of a thing, of a principle, of spiritual revelation, of a mode of behavior, when you are convicted, wrong number three is, I will teach what I believe. I will not be a hypocrite. When you are convicted in your soul of a thing, a principle, a mode of behavior, or code of conduct, you cannot contain your conviction when it is being challenged. You cannot, you cannot contain it. <laughs> Amos 3 8 says, The lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord has spoken, who won't prophesy? Acts 4 18. I just want to give an example of people who were convicted of their moral ground and therefore just didn't budge. 
in Acts 4, 18 through to, through to 20, the, uh, Peter and John have been arrested and detained after healing the man at the beautiful gate in Acts chapter 3 from 1 to 7. So in Acts chapter 4, after they had locked them up one day, one chapter had passed, then they now brought them before the Sanhedrin, and then they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen or heard. Remember, this is Peter. That uh, domestic assistant said, Bros, are you not one of those? Uh, Peter said, Ah, oh, God forbid, but I am making a mistake. Peter stood before the Sanhedrin, 70 men, and said, Guys, it's not happening today. I am not, I am going to preach this Jesus Christ. Is it right in your sight that I should do what you tell me and not do what God has told me? Praise Jesus. Another example is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. Now, you know their story. They said, oh, ye king from Daniel 3, it is the king. We are not careful to answer you in this matter. In fact, some versions say, we don't have to answer you concerning this matter. <laughs> Can you imagine the temerity? Nebuchadnezzar at that time was, uh, was like the president of the United States, probably even bigger. He said, king, king, we, we, we don't have to answer you in this matter. Our God is able to save us. And even if he's not willing to save us, guess what? We are not bowing to your gods. Ah! <laughs> Hallelujah. God had to send the fourth man into the fire to pick, pick them out. Hallelujah. God will send his own fourth man to pick you out of your fire in the name of Jesus as you stand for him in the name of Jesus. Wrong number four. I will value humility above all virtues. Wrong number four. This is John C. Maxwell's wrong number four. I will value humility above all virtues. Um, this I'm going to be reading from Philippians chapter 2, from verse 3. It says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem each other better than themselves. Let not every man on his own things, but every man also... Look not, I beg your pardon, every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which, also, which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. This is it. But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of a man. Because the kingdom of God is populated by servant leaders, the way up is rendering service. Because the kingdom of God is a kingdom that is populated by servant leaders. The way up in the kingdom of God and the way up in life is by rendering service. Check the history of anyone who ended up being very successful. You will see there was a period of apprenticeship. In the world though, and in the Bible, Elisha served Elijah. Yes now, David served Saul. Samuel served Eli. Uh, Joshua served Moses. Uh, we can go on and on. Moses served Pharaoh, served Jethro, his father-in-law. We can go on and on and on. Jacob served Laban. Because the kingdom of God is populated by servant leaders, the way up is by rendering service. We can see, we can see Jesus wash the feet of his mentees. His mentees, oh. <laughs> son of God. David decreed that those who go to battle and those who guard the battle will divide alike of the booty. Jesus, I mean, this one, this one always freaks me out. Jesus described his disciples as friends. Excuse me, why? No, what was it they did? He practically was carrying them for three years. If there's storm, more, he's the one that will stop it. If it's no food, oh, he's the one that will break the bread. He was the one carrying them for three years. Yet, he described them as his friends. Yeah, praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Another key to humility is, you know, he said, John C. Maxwell breaks this one down to, into three parts. He says, remembering the key picture, I mean, remembering the big picture, and the key picture, I mean, the key key to, or a major key to humility is recognizing our limitations. Our limitations in knowledge, ability, power, you know, why God has no such limitations. So when you recognize that God has his omnipotent, his omniscient, 
uh, you know, you begin to you, you begin to want to you know put yourself in your correct place. I mean, I've, I've said it many times in church. Somebody comes to meet me and says, I should do something. And I say, excuse me, you are trying to transfer God's responsibility to me. I'm a man like you. This thing is not for me to do. It is for you to go and face it. I can't do it for you. You have to go do it yourself. God is looking for DUI Christians. Do it yourself. Anyway, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. We're always leaning on our understanding, our limited understanding, our five senses understanding that can't even see everything. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Isaiah 54, 7 and 9 says, 7 through the 9 says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the right, unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him to our God. Uh, for he will abandon, abundantly pardon. Really, it's 8 and 9 I really needed. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, said the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts, than your thoughts. Which means that when we remember this particular verse of scripture, we, we should then say to ourselves, you know what? Who am, am I to feel so funky? Who am I feeling so cool? You know, uh, the Americans will say, uh, feeling cute. You know, don't act cute. Well, that's how the black Americans say it. Praise Jesus. Who are we to be feeling cute? Cute about what? What is it that you have that someone didn't give you? Praise Jesus. And then John 15, 5, it says, I am divine and you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. The combined effect of these verses reminds us of our limitations, God's limitlessness, the omnipotency of God, is our dependency and reliance on Him. Um, he, his ability to bridge the gap between our, 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 between what we know and what we don't know, and between our ability and our responsibility, He bridges that gap. And when you understand that, you can't do it. How does he put it in Matthew? If you cannot uh, increase yourself by one cubit, why worry? So uh, there's, a, there's also, because of all of this, I'm, I was just describing a duty on us to be grateful. We just need to be grateful to him who gave it all for us. Staying grateful and staying in praise. Praise and worship is very powerful because you see, you, you, you begin to see him for who he is. And then you begin to see how little you are for who you really are. Praise Jesus. Wrong five, I will strive to finish well. Wrong five, I will strive to finish well. I will strive to finish well. Faithfulness matters. The, we must all possess the determination to keep building character and living with the highest ethical standards consistently, even till we go to be with him. We must have a determination to keep building character and living with the highest ethical standards consistently till we go to be with him. Again, I mean, there's no better scripture to cite, but, you know, uh, Philippians 3, 13 through to 15, to show that commitment. We'll see this commitment to live ethically, consistently, till we go to be with the Lord in, 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 in Paul's comments here. He says, that's Philippians 3, 8, he says, Yea, doubtlessly, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Watch this, this is the kicker. Proverbs, um, uh, Philippians uh, 3.13 Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. <laughs> With all he, had, he did, Paul did. He says, I count myself not to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of, for the price, price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. In other words, he was talking to people who had attained spiritual maturity. Don't think that you're all that. Oh. Keep on pressing forward. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal the, even this unto you. Praise Jesus. Conclusion. Mechanics of character development. Uh, this one, this one, anyway. No need. Let me just get on with it. Mechanics of character development. This you will not find in the book, but it, to me it's it's, it's critical to understanding the process of how character development can take place. Joshua, uh, sorry, number one point in the mechanics of character development, focus. Number one, focus. 
and I commend for your attention Joshua 1 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Character development does not take place except you have focus on he whose character you are looking to imbibe. Focus. The second mechanic. <laughs> no, maybe that, no, that's wrong. The second point out that the mechanics of character development, or if you like, process, process of character development. We really like all these big high voluting words. Anyway, the big the, the second proposition that I'm making to you in the second process in, in, in of character development is observation. Is observation. Observation. Joshua 1 8 says that we may observe to do or observe. Let's even just hold that one now. Observe. So observation. So first of all, there's focus. So you are looking at it. Then when you are looking at it, you then begin to see something. Observation. You observe it. So it's, it is there you observe the character trait that you, re, you, 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 you realize that you don't quite have or that you are in need of. And then the third process is illumination. The third process in the mechanics of character development is illumination. The Bible says in Ephesians 1.17 that the eyes of our understanding being enlightened. So, so you observe and then there's illumination. There's a light that is cast on it that you begin to understand why you need it, why it is required, and, and, and why it is the will of God for you. The next, uh, the next uh, part of the process of illumination, I mean of um, the, 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 the next, the fourth point in the process of illumination, the fourth, sorry, the fourth point in character development is inculcation. So you have focus, you have observation, you have illumination, and you now have inculcation. That is to say that the moral principle that God, you can see that God has, that you want, that principle is now embedded in you, praise Jesus, is ingrained in, ingrained in you. It is effect if it were a financial transaction right it would be money that has been transferred into your bank account it hits your account you receive the alert it's ingrained in your soul it's there in your soul praise jesus praise jesus you see what happens is what happens is is that your spirit receives it but your spirit then transfers the understanding to your soul your soul then articulates it and then says, okay, this is what it is. Praise Jesus. The ultimate process, the ultimate goal of spirit, soul, and body is that all, both, spirit, both soul and body, are subject to the spirit. The spirit has vivified the soul, has reformed the soul, has transformed it. Romans 12 will say, renewal of your mind. So the moral principle is embedded in, or ingrained in your soul. The psalmist puts it this way in Psalm 119 verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart so that I might not sin against you. The same way Daniel had ingrained the word inside his heart. So in Daniel 1.8 he says, guy, forget it. I'm not eating this swine uh, meal because we, the children of Israel, we don't eat it. Me, I eat child. Sorry. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Now the final one, the final point in process is action action so so remember you have focus you have observation you have illumination you have action inculcation beg your pardon you have inculcation you have uh, illumination inculcation and finally action that is acting out the moral principle in green when such situations and circumstances present themselves acting out the moral principle in green when situations or circumstances present themselves. Jesus' mommy said to him in John 2, 5, whatever I said to them, he said, whatever he says you should do, do it. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3 said, look, king, <laughs> we are not about to bow to this, your God. We will not do so. So forget it. Throne room perspective. <coughs> Throne room perspective. So, so just imagine this picture because this is how it will be. And sometimes it's like this when we, when we pray, when we're really praying to the Lord. This, see this picture. 
So imagine we are seated at the feet of Jesus or the feet of the Lord. And then, you know, like a bunch of children in, a, in nursery school. Then somebody says, ah, but Lord, why are you insistent on us imbibing your character? Why do you want us all to look and sound like you? After all, you made us all different and diverse. Lord, why are you insistent on us imbibing your character? Why do you want us to look and sound like you? After all, you made us all different and diverse. God's reply will go something like this. I want my people to adopt my character. Not because I'm a megalomaniac. Not because I run a command and control structure. Not because I want a bunch of robots or copycat followers. Not because my character, imbibing my character is a fad. Like people like to follow people on social media. No. But you need to know for your own benefit. You need to know that progress outside of me is incurably flawed and will collapse and will not last. Worst of all, it will injure you and it will injure people around you, which is why nobody bothers, and, and this is me now, this is not God speaking, this is why you're not going to give a five-year-old a Ferrari to drive. Why? It doesn't make sense. Because he'll damage it and probably damage, God forbid, himself. The second answer I imagine the Lord would give would be, my children, eh? my character which my children project, my character which my children project in their dealings with the world is such a powerful testimony because the secular world in this moment cannot see Jesus. They can't see Jesus because he's not here. He's seated, at my, at, he's seated with me at the right hand side, at my right hand side in heaven. You guys are the Jesus that the world can see today. And it is your conduct that will persuade them that Jesus is the way. The third answer I imagine that the Lord would give would be, because of the fall, even though your spirit man is resurrected, you now believe in Jesus Christ, so you, you have access to me. Because even though your spirit man is resurrected and has been saved instantly, our souls, your souls are not. Your souls are not saved. Your soul has to be re-educated has to be re-engineered, has to be reconfigured. It's kind of like a flash drive that you have to, what's the what word? You have to delete all the stuff on it and then reconfigure it. Okay, flash it. That's the expression they use for mobile phones. It has to be re-engineered. It has for, for us to operate as God has intended and to fulfill our true potential. This is the process driven by the Holy Spirit called sanctification integrity or the character of God has to be installed in us through the Holy Spirit and a constant exposure to God and the Word. Praise Jesus. By the grace of God, oh, everybody under the sound of my voice this afternoon, oh, by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, you and me, because I'm not perfect, you and me, we are transitioning from Jacob to Israel. Hallelujah. From Adam to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. From carnality to spirituality and perfection. So shall it be for somebody under the sound of my voice in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's somebody that is saying, Lord, how can I move forward? The Lord says, get up. Get up. The righteous may fall seven times, but he rises up again. Don't count him out. So don't count yourself out. Up with you. Keep fighting in the name of Jesus. Amen. Get back on the saddle. God will get you there in the name of Jesus. Amen. Final word of encouragement. Final word of encouragement. Psalm 27, 13 and 14. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Ah, there's somebody that is feeling down right now. Somebody is feeling down listening to me now. The Lord says there will be edification. Amen. There will be elevation. And then there will be acceleration Amen. in the name of Jesus. He says, wait on the Lord, Psalm 27 verse 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And then the final one is Hebrews 13 verse 5 from the Amplified Version. The sealing. For he, God himself, has said. Please pay attention to this scripture. Catch it in your spirit. 
I will not in any way fail you. Aya! No give you up. Hallelujah. No leave you without support. I will not. The Lord repeats it again. I will not. The Lord repeats it again. I will not in any degree leave you helpless. No forsake you. No let you down. That is relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. So shall it be for somebody with you in the name of Jesus. So shall it be for somebody who is listening to me in the name of Jesus. The Lord said to me, how can I ignore my crying child? God will not ignore you in the name of Jesus. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. Your job is to stay close to the Lord. Put your hand not into iniquity. Stay on the straight and on the narrow. Correct your ways by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all these things that I've said will accrue to you and to me in the name of Jesus. The final altar call is, if there's anybody on this call that has not given his life to Jesus, I'd like you to just lift your hand where you are and say, Lord Jesus, please accept me as one of your own today, as a child of the Most High. Take away my iniquities by the blood of the Lamb. Transfer your character to me. Write my name permanently in the book of life. Eh? And when you come to take your people, don't leave me behind. Sanctify me daily. In Jesus' mighty name, I have declared. Amen and amen. God bless you. Stay wealthy. Stay healthy. Stay free of COVID. In Jesus' name. Please remember to join in the main service at 4.30. I'm sure you're in for an action-packed time too in the presence of the Lord in Jesus' name. Shalom.